epidemiology and, and medicine. Uh, this slide, you can't read it, but you can see that the known effects of sleep deprivation are uh, those that affect the brain, the heart, the muscles, the tendons, the joints, uh, certain uh, uh, glands, the, the, particularly the pancreas and the uh, thymus gland. And there can be dire effects of health if, if sleep is disturbed. And this is one of the major complaints of people who live too near uh, wind turbines. These are levels that you might have seen before as a commission. Uh, the World Health Organization says there, start to, there starts to be problems with sleep uh, around uh, between 30 and 40 decibels. Uh, they get more severe and uh, uh, vulnerable groups, uh, children, uh, elderly adults, and uh, kids with uh, diseases, uh, disorders, <coughs> chronic diseases, are most, uh, more effective than, than others. Above uh, 55, you, have, you want to stay away from that for sure because um, a sizable number of people are going to be annoyed and sleep disturbed and possibly have even cardiovascular disease. Uh, I mentioned Pierpont. Pierpont published a book in 2009. Uh, it's been denigrated, uh, downplayed by the wind industry. She uh, followed 10 families of 38, I believe 38 people in those families, not a large sample. Uh, and she's a pediatric neurologist. Uh, I'm, yeah, I think she is a neurologist. And she uh, is a physician. Uh, Yale, Princeton, Johns Hopkins, the whole group works. And She's, cl she's claimed that in her book that these are all symptoms that people who live around wind turbines have uh, noticed. Now, I'll be fair, these are the arguments against that research there, that have been put out there. Uh, a small sample was used by Pierpont. I just gave you the number of people. It's a fairly small sample, but you have a lot of literature with 12 subjects, a lot of studies out there published in peer review research literature is uh, 10, 12, 15, 20 subjects. And she had 38 subjects. Uh, she conducted no diagnostic tests. She uh, self-published her book. She actually, it was a very highly peer-reviewed book, uh, but it wasn't in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, she was, uh, she used a sample bias. The people she studied uh, were biased in the sense that is a sort of a, a selection bias because uh, they were all exposed to wind turbines. Okay. So she took some of the people who probably had severe complaints and, and possibly severe problems because they lived fairly close to turbines. And some people say she made no real new discoveries. Uh, the argument used to support uh, her work have basically taken the view that uh, an association is there between the cause and effect. If you take people out of the condition, uh, away from wind turbines, they tend to get better. The symptoms tend to go away. So there's a direct link between the cause and the effect, she says. Uh, I gave you the other, uh, I mentioned her book is highly peer-reviewed, uh, that it is confirmed by a number of, uh, worldwide it's confirmed by a number of anecdotal reports, as well as some other uh, people's work. I think this is a curiosity. There's something called vibroacoustic disease um, that uh, one research team in uh, Portugal have studied uh, pretty extensively. Uh, these are pretty severe symptoms they claim are due to uh, long and, and, and loud exposures to wind turbines. I don't think there's anybody in the U.S. who's exposed to these levels for this long. Uh, but I say this is a curiosity. I don't know that uh, one group is enough. I think other people need to confirm this before I would believe this. Uh, we didn't talk about it in our article. Uh, we don't know um, uh, if others are working on, on you know, this kind of research now or not. But it goes a little bit beyond what Pierpont's saying, and I don't know what differences there are between VAD and the, 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 all the things on the list that, from, from Pierpont's book that I talked about earlier. This is a very interesting study. This was done in 2010 by Dr. Michael Nissenbaum, who's a physician, uh, I believe he's an epidemiologist in Maine. This was in Mars Hill, Maine. Uh, these figures are pretty uh, graphic. Uh, he looked at people exposed uh, and not exposed to wind turbines. The not exposed people were uh, three miles or, or about three miles from wind turbines. The people who were exposed were within 3,500 feet. So he compared these symptoms in those two groups directly. And you can read the numbers. The, uh, the number at the bottom is not a percent, it's a number. The 15 prescriptions, there were actually 21 prescriptions uh, prescribed. 
uh, people took them up on 15 uh, in the exposed group, and, and, the, uh, and there were only four prescriptions in the uh, non-exposed group. Uh, the, the most uh, uh, obvious difference here is the reduced quality of life based on recent history in or outside of the exposed area, 95% to 0%. Uh, depression was reported by more than a third. I don't know the number, that's why you have an asterisk there for the exposed group. But notice there were 22 people in the exposed and 27 people in the non-exposed group. And Dr. Nissenbaum is, uh, has repeated that study. I think he was probably criticized for not having a control group. He's now done it with control group, uh, with an, I shouldn't say a control group, but he's now done it more extensively with more subjects and is uh, about, I think, about to publish it. He's compared, uh, again, two groups based on distance from wind turbines. And he has said, he's told me indirectly through another person we both know, that uh, uh, the results coming out of that study are going to be at least as dramatic as the one I just showed you in 2010. Uh, I'm, I'm probably out of time. Uh, I'd like to do a few more slides if I could. We have time? Okay. Uh, this uh, picture is a, the inner ear, it's a, called the cochlea. It's unrolled. The cochlea is a little snail shaped, very small, tiny thing on each side of our head. We have two of them, of course. These are not outer ears, these are inner ears. These are very useless, almost useless parts of the ear. The <coughs> uh, then you have the ear canal, the eardrum, and the middle ear, and inside that, toward the center of the head, you have the inner ears. Okay? And so, uh, there's, I won't go into an anatomical detail here, uh, but you have a lot of fluid, uh, fluids, you have two different fluids, and you have a lot of very sensitive hair cells and uh, very uh, sensitive tissue uh, in those areas. And at, at the peak of the, uh, whoops, um, at the peak of the, called the apical end, the apex of the cochlea, you have a continuous channel where uh, disturbances of the fluid that come from hearing sound uh, can pass through. That's called the helicotrema. The whole area is called the, the apex, and the helicotrema is that channel that connects two uh, different canals or channels. Uh, some recent literature, uh, this is very basic research. Uh, your tax money has paid for this research. Uh, Dr. Alex Salt is a, a PhD hearing scientist from the University of St. Louis, I believe, University of Washington, St. Louis, who has uh, done some highly peer-reviewed work. Uh, some of it's published and some more of it's going to be published. He says that the, the ear is most sensitive to, he's done studies that show that the ear is most sensitive to infrasound, that sound we don't really hear, when there's no other sounds present, when there's no high frequencies present. I won't go into, I don't even know why, but the physiology of that is a little bit beyond me, but I, I do understand what I, more or less what I read of, of his research. That uh, it says when things are very quiet, such as not as not at night, such as at night, uh, Infrasound is people. More people are going to be more sensitive to it. Uh, the very uh, microscopic view of the inner ear, the cochlea, uh, shows there's some hair cells, outer and inner hair cells. Uh, these cells uh, move. I won't. Again, we don't have time for an anatomy lesson, and I'm sure you don't want that. But basically, the sound gets from here to the brain through the inner hair cells. Okay, and he says that uh, basically. A high level infrasound probably is getting to the brain. Biological, it's biologically plausible through the anatomy that sound gets to the brain even though it comes through the ear and we don't even hear it or register it as sound. And so he attributes uh, sensations and complaints of earfulness, pressure, discomfort, disturbed sleep, uh, just a few of the many things that Pierpont talked about uh, to uh, uh, the fact that the ear can pass sounds to the brain that aren't perceived as sound. There's also some issues with the, uh, another part of our inner ear is the balance mechanism, the vestibular system, the semicircular canals. We keep our position in space um, and the vibration, it's sensitive to vibration, the uh, vestibular portion of the ear. And some of the symptoms that, uh, like the VAD I talked about, the Portuguese group, have talked about uh, is probably mediated if it's present, it's mediated through the vestibular uh, part of the ear. Uh, Salt says that the idea that infrasound effects can be dismissed because they are audible is not, not correct. Okay? 
Um, I'm going to. I, I know I'm out of time. These are some. Uh, these two slides are Dr. Carl Phillips, epidemiologist, who testified to the Wisconsin Public Service Commission last summer. Uh, he has some interesting conclusions about. It is very feasible that uh, there, there is an explanation for some of these uh, complaints. Uh, there are health reported. There are uh, reported health effects. Uh, some are psychological that are, in, in his mind as an epidemiologist, are just as real as some physical complaints. Um, again, I don't want to just read slides here, so I'm going to let you read that. Uh, my own conclusions are these. Uh, this is obvious. This is, everybody knew this before you came. Uh, the energy that pr is produced by wind turbine noise is mostly acoustic energy. Uh, some of it is audible. Some of it we can hear. Some of it we cannot. Okay? Uh, audible sound is that which is most responsible for sleep disturbance complaints. Um, and lack of sleep, of course, I think everybody agrees, uh, can cause uh, adverse health effects. Um, it's true, though, that infrasound, per se, has not been directly linked to adverse health effects. The research is not yet conclusive. So I give you that. Certainly that's true. Uh, it, it is all, but it's biologically plausible that it could be true. That's what I'm saying. Um, this is just a simple statement I think everybody needs to think about. We would do well to learn from reports of people around the world who have been affected by wind turbines and, and have complained about them. Until we can find a real link, establish a real uh, specific link to adverse health effects and wind turbine noise, we ought to use that principle called the precautionary principle and not put wind turbines at distances that we know are going to cause problems. Not just complaints in legal cases, but, but complaints of annoyance and health problems. Okay? And so distance is a very critical, we haven't been able to talk about that here. If anybody has questions on any of this, uh, Feel free to ask now. Uh, I give you my contact information. I would be glad to take your phone calls or your emails and, and any other time as well. Um, was there any data collected on pre-existing conditions of these people that complained about issues? Oh, you're that talking about the Pierpont? Well, any of these things. Pierpont collected a lot of history data, case history data. I mean, things. would these people possibly have a pre-existing condition for heart or... Yeah, that's, that's one of those confounding effects I talked about. A good study will rule out those things and will keep people out of the study if that's true. One by enough bones. And, and I, I think those were controlled very well in his study, probably better than some others. Good question. Um, what is the, could you define the word anecdotal? Anecdotal? Yeah. Uh, things that I just, an anecdote is something, a little, little story I tell you, a little observation, an anecdotal a story. Uh, um, Anecdote is just a report. Somebody tells you something. Right. Um, radiation and, is bad, correct? Well, uh, don't Low you believe radiation, radiation from radiation. nuclear plants is bad? I mean, yeah. Hiroshima. Any kind, of, any kind of radiation do we think that is bad? Uh, you know, I'm not going to get into cell phones, and I don't know. I mean, you know, that's being questioned. Uh, okay. Even radiation from cell phones that with constant use, with a lot of use. How far does the how far I don't it, think radiation involved is involved with right, wind no, turbines. Sure. Let's get that. Okay. How far does the infrasound travel? Interesting question. Uh, low and frequency. Does it, does it? Does it also? Not, does it? Um, is it four dimensional? In other words, from the hub, does it? Propagates. Go, propagates four di or yeah. three dimensional. Yeah. Yeah. yeah three dimensionally. The lower the frequency, the bigger the wavelength. The, the, the wavelength is the distance between the peaks of energy. Okay, uh, and low frequencies can bend around corners. If I talk to you like this, you can hear me pretty well. But if I talk to you like this, it sounds like a little bit like you have a high frequency hearing problem because the sound, the high frequencies are being blocked. But the low frequencies get around that blockage, and low frequencies can penetrate homes. They can vibrate struct. They can vibrate structures. And I'm, I'm including buildings, I'm including rooms in buildings, and I'm including bodies, physical bodies, if it's loud enough, if it's high enough. Um, the sleep disturbance, would shutting the windows or air conditioning uh, stop the... Some studies have said 15 to 17 decibels attenuation or reduction with the window closed 
but I don't know exactly if that includes all the low, it I don't think it includes the very low frequencies. I think it's mostly in the I mean, low frequency for no mid range. A, a mitigation thing would be air conditioning. Uh, I'm sorry, the first part is a mitigation tool. Mitigation tool. Uh, mitigating in what sense? Uh, if someone complained of of um, sleep disturbance, if they excuse me, if they had air conditioning and shut the windows in the summertime. Uh, certainly, that makes a difference. Okay. The, the, again, comparing air conditioners to wind turbine noise <laughs> is a little well, bit no, I'm just, I'm yeah. just wondering, you know, if, if, for instance, they were running air conditioning or if they had air conditioning, because we you know it, it seems to be worse in the summertime when it's. Hot well, you're running your air conditioner only when it's hot and humid, right? right? So that's why I was wondering, you know, does that? Uh, shutting shutting your windows certainly can help. I mean, you're lucky if your bedroom uh, window is not right next to the air conditioner, or the air conditioner is not right next to your yeah. bedroom window. 